Now that we've got a working R Markdown document, let's try to make that interactive. So before you start, first make sure that your HTML document knits successfully based on that recipe that we followed on the last slide. If it does, then there's a couple of things you need to do to make the document interactive. The first thing we need to do is add runtime colon space shiny to the header. This tells the document to use the shiny runtime and shiny is a package in R that helps you make documents interactive. The next thing you need to do is add library shiny and library rlang to the first code chunk right after where you wrote library tidyverse. So library shiny will give you access to all the various inputs that you want to add to the um, to your document, as well as some of the render functions that we'll be telling you about. Um, and then the rlang package is what you're going to use to use that parse expression function that we learned earlier. Next, you'll disable the preview. And I'll get to what I mean um, when I say disable the preview in a later slide with a little screenshot. Then we'll actually run the document. So remember how uh, when we had an R Markdown document, we pressed the knit button in order to actually knit it. Once you add the shiny runtime to your header, you will no longer have the knit button there. Instead, you'll have a, a run document button there. And so you have to press that. Because we disabled the preview, RStudio will tell us uh, the, the website where we need to browse to in a web browser in order to see our interactive document. And just note that that website is running locally on your computer. So when you browse to that, you're not browsing to you know, a website somewhere on the web. That's a, a local website running kind of locally on your computer. And typically, it'll start with 127.0.0.1, uh, but not necessarily always. Congratulations. If you followed all these steps, you now have an interactive document. So you might be wondering, uh, where is the interactivity? And we'll come back to that. So uh, let's actually walk through what this looks like in our studio. So in order to make our document interactive, the first thing we need to do is to add that runtime of Shiny and to make sure we're dealing with an HTML document and not an HTML notebook. So we added the Shiny runtime to the header. The next thing we do is we add the Shiny and the Rlang packages to uh, the first code chunk after library tidyverse. Then we'll turn off the preview. So you'll actually go uh, over here, uh, click that settings button, and then you'll scroll down and press this no preview button uh, or option, which will tell it not to try to render uh, this interactive document inside of RStudio, but to let you open it in a web browser, uh, which tends to be a little bit more stable um, and not crash. Then you'll press the run document button. And what you'll be, what will happen next is once it knits this document, um, it'll actually tell you that it's available for access um, at this website. And again, that website is on your computer itself, not somewhere else on the web. So you'll actually copy paste that, um, that website link, including the numbers after the colon, into a browser like Chrome, hit enter, and you'll actually see this site come to life. So where is the interactivity here? Um, so far, all I've done is make an R Markdown document show up in a browser in a really complicated way. So we still have to add this interactivity to this document, well, which we'll cover next. So here's the recipe for making an interactive document interactive after you've covered those initial steps um, of addressing 
the header, addressing adding the packages, and just the mechanics of running the document in a browser. The first thing we need to do is specify our inputs. So an example of what I consider inputs are like a select input or a select menu, um, a slider input, and a checkbox input. Next, you'll need to link those input values back to your analysis. So if you have a select input that lets you select something, what changes in the analysis as a result of you doing that select input? Finally, any interactive part of your analysis needs to be wrapped inside of a render function. And I wrote render underscore, 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 not to tell you that that's actually the name of the function, simply that there are several different render functions. For example, render table is a way of rendering a data frame. Render plot is a way to render a plot. And any other kind of output, you can use render print. So as an example here, if we took that question from lab five, where I asked you to show me the relationship between age and height, you could make this interactive by letting you decide, letting you, uh, or the, letting the user choose what goes on the y-axis. Is it height or is it weight? I could also choose to limit the age range on the x-axis. So the default is you know, zero to 100 because that's the overall range. But maybe I only want to look at people between the ages of zero and 50, or maybe between 40 and 50. And finally, maybe I don't want that smooth line to show up by default, but I want to make it easy for the user to click a button um, or a checkbox, which makes that smooth line show up. So let's go through each of these inputs and see how we can link them to our analysis. So the first input we're going to look at is that select menu or select input, which has the value height selected. But if you were to click on it, you would see height and then weight. So because that input is controlling what's on the y-axis, we're going to name that input yvar, or you know, short for y variable. We use the select input function where the i is capital. And so the first argument is the name of that variable in quotes. The second argument is the label, which is just that question that's going to show up to the end user. So which variable would you like on the y-axis? And then we have to tell it what the choices should be that go into that uh, select input. So if we go back and look at this again, notice that which variable on y-axis is literally the text I'm showing the user. And then the choices are height and weight. And by default, that first option is selected. That's why you only see height. We can do the same thing for um, the slider input, which has an age range. So let's name that variable age range. And when I say name that variable, that's the variable we're going to refer to when we choose to update that ggplot. We again have to give it a label. With slider input, you can also give it a min, you have to give it a min and a max. So what is the leftmost value and the rightmost value for the number. What's the default range to start with? So in this case, the default range was the same as my overall you know, minimum and maximum. But I could have chose to have all the ages between 40 and 50 as my initial defaults when that page gets loaded. If you specify two values here under the value argument, like 0, 100 separated by the C function, that actually tells um, Shiny that you want a two-sided slider input, such that both the left side and the right side are slidable. If you only put one value here, for example, 0 or 50 or 100, then it tells Shiny, don't make this a two-sided slider input, just a one-sided slider input. In other words, you, all you can do is change um, you know, the actual age, um, but you can only select one value, not like a range between two values. 
So simply by giving va the value either one, one thing or two things, you're telling it which kind of a slider to draw. And then you can set step to 10. And what this is telling you, uh, Shiny, is that when you actually go to slide that slider input, the only options you can select are multiples of 10. Uh, because I started at zero and went to 100, you know, 0, 10, 20, 30 are going to be the available options so that I'm not, you know, accidentally selecting some, you know, very specific fraction like 3.44 or something. And to get that checkbox input to show up, I first have to name the um, variable that I want to create called smooth line. Add the label, should we show the smooth line? And the default value is usually false. Um, but I, here I just chose to specify it, value equals false. But I could have said value equals true in, in all capitals, and it would have uh, it would be checked by default. One thing I want you to notice here is that when I named the variable yvar, age range, and smooth line, I put those variable names in quotes. This is pretty much the only time in all of where you're working with R that you're going to put a variable name in quotes is in the select input, slider input, or any of the input functions in Shiny. So it, what I don't want you to take away from this is that it's totally fine to put the variable names in quotes. No, generally it's not fine. This is the only exception to that rule. And the reason it's an exception is because this line of code will get converted into HTML directly. Um, and in HTML, um, you know, or in JavaScript, for example, variable names have to be uh, uh, in quotes when you're assigning them to something. So just remember, if you're dealing with inputs, put the variable names in quotes. OK. So next, we want to actually link the input value to the analysis. And so let's ignore this render plot function for a second and move to the next line. So we start with patience. We then pipe it to ggplot, AES for aesthetic, x equals age, y equals parse expression input dollar sign y var plus g on point plus chord Cartesian x lim equals c input dollar sign age range bracket one, input dollar sign age range bracket two. And then uh, end parenthesis. There's a lot to unpack here, so let me walk you through this. If you had written out patience, then, then ggplot aes x equals age, y equals height, plus g on point, plus chord Cartesian, x lim equals 0, 100 uh, separated by a c function, that wouldn't be all that foreign to you because we've actually covered that in the ggplot lecture. However, the things that are changing here is that you are taking height in quotes that was produced by the select input function and pretending as if you had typed it in into that highlighted portion next to the y equals. ggplot by default won't let us write y equals um, height in quotes. We have to actually write out the word height. And so the way around that is that since we, keep, we since all we have is this input dollar sign y var, which contains the value height in quotes, to make it actually be typed out onto the screen, we have to parse it using that parse expression function. You might also be wondering why I have input dollar sign y var. So on the last screen, when I was dealing with the inputs, um, I had created these variables in quotes inside of the various input functions. When you create any of these input functions using Shiny, what happens is that there is an object called input that gets created. And when you actually want to reference the values that are inside of this, you know, that are being selected by the user, you, you type out input dollar sign and then the name of the variable. 
And that, when you do that, that does not go in quotes. So in the input function, they go in quotes. When you're actually accessing it um, for the purposes of coding, the value is input dollar sign yvar to get to the um, select input selection that was made by the user. Okay. And then I have chord Cartesian. And remember, chord Cartesian um, has, you know, the main purpose of that function is it lets you zoom in to the part of the plot. And so when I provide x lim equals, those are x limits, which means the first value is my leftmost range, my uh, second value is the rightmost range. And so I'm accessing that age range uh, that came from the slider input here. And so again, it's input dollar sign age range. And because age range has two possible values, the first one you uh, get to by doing bracket one, the second one you get to by doing bracket two. Because age range just contains a number, it doesn't contain the name of a variable, you don't actually have to parse the expression here. And in fact, parsing the expression uh, may even produce an error. So, you know, two simple rules to remember would be, if you're dealing with select input, you typically want to parse the expression. If you're dealing with uh, slider input, you typically don't need to parse the expression. Another simple kind of heuristic would be, if your input uh, uh, contains the name of a variable, then you have to parse it. If it just contains values that you're going to use directly, like a number, then you typically don't need to parse it. That's why age range uh, is not surrounded by that parse expression function. So key takeaways, in the, in the input function, like select input, the variable name was in quotes, for example, yvar in quotes. But in the render plot function, um, it, it is not surrounded by quotes. And you refer to it using input dollar sign yvar. Um, that might look familiar to you because if you want to reference the name of a column inside of a data frame, one way to do that is to do data frame dollar sign column name. But input actually isn't a type of data frame. It's a type of data object called a list. Um, and we won't be working with or talking about lists in detail in this class, but the way you access an object in a list is the same as the way you access a column in a data frame using that dollar sign. Also notice that I put curly braces inside of the render plot. Um, the main purpose of those curly bra braces is that it lets me run multiple lines of code inside of render plot. So if I had had to add you know, additional lines here where I was storing the value of the plot to something and then you know, making additional changes to the plot, um, I'd be able to do that because uh, it's surrounded by curly braces. So I typically always do render plot with curly braces inside of it, and then I put my code there. If you only have one line of code, it's technically not required. But um, as a good practice for render plot, always use curly braces inside. We used parse expression in one place when referring to the input variable and not in the other. I already talked a little bit about why that was, but feel free to rewind or to ask me if you have questions about why we use it in that first uh, highlighted portion and not the second. And the shortcut here is that when you're referring to a variable name, like height or weight, you've got to parse it. When you're just referring to a value like a number, you typically uh, don't need to parse it and shouldn't parse it. What if you forgot the render plot? So what if you typed in all of this stuff in your uh, R Markdown document and did not uh, put the render plot around it? What would happen then? Uh, you'll actually get an error. And the reason is because anytime you access that input object, where it's input dollar sign, the only place you can really access that is inside of one of the render functions. The render functions specify that the contents within it are reactive or interactive. And so 
when you use the render function, it tells R, this portion is the part that needs to be updated. Anytime uh, a user makes a selection or changes one of the input values. So if you access an input value inside of outside of a render function, Shina will give you an error. And the error you'll get will look like this. Error, operation not allowed without an active reactive context. And all that means is that you try to do something that can only be done inside of one of these render functions. And uh, they write here a reactive expression, but uh, what they're really referring to is these render functions, which are interactive or reactive. Okay. So now that we've done all this, let's take a look at uh, this as a whole and try to walk through this one more time. So the first thing we had to do was specify our inputs. The second thing we had to do was link our input value to the analysis. The third thing we had to do was place the interactive part of the analysis inside of a render function. For example, here it was render plot, but the other options available to us are render table and render print. Let's also try to add that checkbox in now and see if we can get that smooth line to show up. So here's how we specified our inputs one more time. Now, if we wanted to add that checkbox, um, we created it back here. So we've got smooth line. Should we show the smooth line and value equals false? Let's actually add this to the code. In order to do this, we actually need to store our ggplot object um, to a variable. And in this case, I'm going to call that variable ageplot. The reason we, we need to do this is, is because there's no way to parse that true or false in order to tell ggplot whether it should or shouldn't add um, the checkbox input you know, uh, to the plot. So what you can do is take your plot without the checkbox input, store the value to age plot, and then using a standard if then, which we actually have not covered in this class, you check the value of smooth line. And if it's true, then you add this smooth line to it. If it's not true, then you just show the original plot without the smooth line. Note that if else here doesn't work because that is intended for use within data frames. Uh, so if you try the if underscore else function, um, you'll get an error here. Uh, because it's not designed to work with ggplot objects. So here we're using standard programming, which we haven't covered in class. So if you know this is confusing or intimidating to you, I am not expecting you to add a checkbox input anywhere in your analyses uh, for the purposes of lab or homework. I just wanted to show you that you know this concept of having uh, inputs that you can link to outputs kind of interactively um, is really powerful, and you can do some really cool things with it. And notice that all of this code is wrapped inside of a render plot function with curly braces. Um, so don't forget that, otherwise you'll get that error. So how could we make this question interactive? Uh, let's take a look at this question. What is the mean systolic blood pressure for individuals with and without diabetes? How about for congestive heart failure? So we had this question on lab five. And the, the correct answer was that for individuals without diabetes, the mean systolic blood pressure was 123. And for individuals with diabetes, the mean systolic blood pressure was 131. And you know, what if we wanted to answer this question for people with congestive heart failure, or maybe people of different ages, such that if I you know, were to click that top menu and select CHF and click that second menu, uh, the second select input and select uh, age greater than 65, I'd get the correct information out um, without having to actually do any coding myself. So let's follow our recipe. The first thing was we have to specify our inputs. And if you look back here, we actually have two inputs. Uh, they're both select inputs. And that first question 
um, is about the diagnosis, and the second question is about uh, filtering based on age. So let's name our first select input variable uh, diagnosis, and remember that in the input variable in the input functions that goes in quotes. The next is the label. So what do we actually what what are we going to call this or, or you know show the user as a instruction for selecting a value? Which diagnosis would you like to explore? And then the choices here are diabetes or CHF. The second select input we'll call it age filter. We'll ask, you know, is this meant for everyone? And the choices here are true and age greater than 65. And the reason I put true here is that we're going to use the filter function. And if the filter function has the value of true inside it, then it selects every single row. If it has any other criteria, like age greater than 65, then it's only going to filter in those rows where age is greater than 65. And look here that, you know, true and age greater than 65 are both surrounded in quotes. You couldn't possibly type those in without quotes because you'd, you'd end up getting an error. Um, so they are, you know, surrounded by quotes here. And that's why, you know, as a hint, we'll have to deal with that when we link those to the output. So going back one more time, the output here is actually a data frame. Um, and so when we're making a data frame, we have to use the render table function. So after we make our inputs, now let's link them to the analysis. So here we start with render table, again with curly braces inside. We'll left join our patient's data frame with the PMH data frame, just like we did in, in uh, week five of lab. Um, let me skip this filter and go to the group by. So in our lab, we actually wrote group by diabetes here. But here, I actually want to group by uh, whatever the user selects uh, in that diagnosis select input. So the way I access the value of the diagnosis select input is input dollar sign diagnosis. And then what I get back is the word diabetes in quotes. And so the way I get rid of those quotes to be able to access the actual variable diabetes is by using that parse expression function. Let's go one line above. Um, if I wanted to filter and I typed filter true, I'd basically get back every single row. If I typed filter age greater than 65, I'd only get back this information for individuals above 65. But if I want to take the quote, the quoted uh, true or the quoted age greater than 65 and turn that into, uh, you know, pretend as if I typed it in here uh, in the code. So remove those quotes. The only way I can do that is to parse it. And that's why both of these select inputs, um, as I alluded to earlier, the only way we can get to the value is by parsing it um, because they have variable names contained inside the inputs. And then we just do summarize SBP equals mean SBP and, and um, throw out the missing values. And then we have to end the curly brace and end the parentheses from that render table function. So if you actually add in those select inputs and this line of code uh, that I just showed you on the last slide, that will actually make that question interactive and let you uh, play with it when you go ahead and run the document. So now we'll work together to convert Lab 5 into an interactive markdown document. And the steps are, first, make sure the document knits as a non-interactive markdown document. Add that shiny runtime to the header. Add library shiny and library rlang to the first code chunk after library tidyverse. Specify the inputs. Link the inputs to the analysis. And make sure that any analysis that, that is interactive is wrapped inside of one of those render functions. Render you know, plot, render table, or render print. And typically, I put curly braces inside uh, so that I can run multiple lines of code. Then make sure to disable the preview so that your uh, interactive document is not rendered in uh, RStudio, but actually is rendered in a browser. And then run the document 
And then when you run the document, you'll get back a website link that's a website that's local on your computer, and you'll copy paste that over to a web browser. So we'll step through that separately in a separate video and do that together. But um, let's talk about how you can make these interactive documents available to others. So unlike the R notebook uh, HTML files or the R markdown HTML files, Shiny apps are actually a combination of HTML, JavaScript, and R. Um, and the key part of that is the R piece. So if you just share the HTML file um, or you just share the R markdown document with someone, they would have to have you know, R installed on their computer to run your Shiny app. So that's often not convenient because you can't necessarily expect the folks you're sharing your uh, analysis with will have R installed. So you can actually publish them to the web. Um, and the easiest option to do this is to publish them to shinyapps.io. Um, that's free for a limited number of hours of usage per month, um, but it's really easy to do inside of RStudio. And typically, you know, for most analyses, it's plenty of time uh, for users to interact with your uh, analysis. The medical school actually has a Shiny uh, Pro server that's free to use. So if you are planning to you know, work with Shiny or um, interactive documents regularly, I would encourage you to reach out to me and I can see if we can get you an account at the medical school's uh, Shiny server. But if you want to publish your analysis to shinyapps.io for free as a starting point, the way to do that is in RStudio, when you have your, uh, you know, your interactive document open, uh, so notice that it has a shiny runtime and it's got the run document button above it, you'll go to this funny looking blue icon on the top right and you click the arrow next to it and you'll see this button, publish document. So you'll actually go ahead and click that button and it may ask you to update some packages and you may have to set up an account here so that you actually can log into your Shiny Apps account. But this is where you can um, upload shine, you know, uh, interactive documents for others to access. And so just make sure to click that arrow. So I've actually found interactive documents really helpful in order, uh, in order to share some of the analyses that I've done. And one of the examples where I've used it is in sharing the results of predictive models. So very similar to the select inputs and slider inputs that I showed you on the last several slides, this uh, web page here is actually made up entirely of those same types of inputs. And so when a user selects that a patient with prostate cancer has cancer that's not metastatic and enters in you know, characteristics about the individual and about their cancer and they hit calculate, this actually dynamically generates a ggplot uh, which has the you know various treatment options that they're likely to be recommended. And all of this works very similarly to the interactive document uh, that I've shown you how to build uh, in this lecture. So you might be wondering, are Shiny apps the only way to make documents interactive in R? Um, now the Shiny package is very powerful because it lets you run any R code interactively. So on the last slide where I showed you the uh, predictive model for treatment choice in prostate cancer, that's running a random forest machine learning model in the background. Um, and so it can really run any R code inside of it, which is what makes uh, Shiny powerful. You don't need to worry about the details of how to actually display the output on a web page. All of that HTML uh, and JavaScript that it took to get that to work properly is taken care of by Shiny. But the main downside is, is that you have to have access to a Shiny server to perform the computations. And luckily in the medical school, we have you know, free access to one, but there might be times that you don't have access to one and you don't wanna use the you know, publicly available shinyapps.io uh, website. So there are times where you just need very basic analytics that don't require R per se. Um, and some examples of this are, let's say you're filtering rows uh, in a data frame. Uh, or maybe you're calculating a mean or a median, which could be done, done in JavaScript. For such cases, they actually have 
a, a series of things called HTML widgets in R that don't require you to use a shiny runtime. So you can share your document uh, just as an HTML file, or you can just upload the HTML file to the web um, and it doesn't require R to be running in the background. And if you're curious about making interactive documents in this way, I'd encourage you to check out the HTML widgets gallery at htmlwidget.org. Um, and they have a lot of sophisticated things you can do here, like interactive maps uh, with the leaflet package or interactive data frames with the DT package. But because those require additional functions and additional packages, I chose to focus on Shiny, which is the main way of making general purpose R code interactive.